speed at which we're growing is demonstrated by the fact that even since that was produced overnight, we've got an extra 3,000 supporters. Um, we're gaining this support uh, without question. People want change, and our intention is very clear. The two-party political system has failed in this country. It's failed Britain, it's failed Brexit, and it's failing democracy. We aim, without question, to win these European elections comprehensively. And there's no doubt that the Brexit Party candidates, with their skills, their achievements, their successes, their can-do, make-do attitude, is without question the highest quality list of candidates that has ever stood for public office in this country in a generation. And one of, the redeem, one of the consistent features of those candidates is that they are almost all experienced in negotiation. And we have a very clear message which we're setting out in this pledge card that we are announcing and giving out this morning. A very clear message for voters and to Westminster. Firstly, a vote for the Brexit Party is a clear vote for a WTO Brexit. No ifs, no buts. Secondly, a vote for the Brexit Party is a vote that our elected MEPs should play a significant role in the future negotiating team. We will demand such a role because we will be the party with the biggest, the most clear democratic mandate to be involved in those negotiations. And that will be a mandate from the people. Westminster MPs were elected in 2017 and that both main parties stood on a manifesto to leave the single market and to leave the customs union. Over 80% of the population voted for those manifestos. Westminster have had their chance in these negotiations and the truth is they've blown it. I first called for the negotiating team to be changed in December 2017 when it was quite clear that they were making a complete shambles of it. Instead, the civil service, government and MPs, they've messed up. They've carried on with the most shambolic negotiation this country's ever seen, and it's led to a complete and utter humiliation where our Prime Minister has not once but twice had to write begging letters to overseas leaders. Basically, they've had the wrong people inexperienced in negotiation and a civil service that don't believe in what they're negotiating for. And let's be honest, we in the Brexit Party stand for basic, common sense, competent politics. And it is basic common sense that you should always have people negotiating who actually believe in what they're <coughs> negotiating for. So I repeat, ladies and gentlemen, a vote for the Brexit Party is a vote for a WTO Brexit. It's also a vote for our elected MEPs to play a significant role in the future negotiating team. Our voters will expect and demand nothing less. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to hand over to the leader of our party, Nigel Farage. Richard, thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's very strange. It's rather like a phony election, isn't it? Everyone pretends it's not going to happen, and yet it is going to happen in 16 days' time. But we keep being told, well, maybe there'll be a deal, maybe the elections will be stopped. Well, just remember this. Millions of postal votes have already been delivered. A very large number of people have already voted. Surely our government couldn't rob us of another vote, could they? No, I don't think so. And I think these elections will take place in 16 days' time. And as Richard's made clear, and as our pledge card that we're launching today also makes clear, you know, we are aiming for a clean break Brexit. That is what people want, to leave the European Union, to leave the single market, to leave the customs union, the European Court of Justice, and to get on with the rest of our lives. That's our message. That's what we're campaigning on. We want democracy respected and we want promises, repeated promises, to be kept. Uh, my own view is that throughout all of this, over the course of the last three years, our political class have behaved despicably, and that that behaviour is getting worse by the day. And I say that 
as uh, Mrs May's negotiating team and Mr Corbyn's negotiating team are no doubt in Downing Street as we talk, trying to put together some new formula. What they're actually trying to do is to form a coalition against the people. And if you think uh, that the public are angry at Brexit not being delivered, this will make them furious. A customs union alignment with single market rules is very clearly not what we voted for. And I've come to the view that actually just winning these European elections, well, that'll be great, but it won't be enough. And even if we get forced into having to fight a second referendum and we win it by a bigger margin, which I certainly believe we would, I'm not even convinced then that this government and this parliament would actually deliver the will of the people. So be in no doubt, for us, these European elections on May the 23rd are but a first step. Uh, and we intend, as the slogan says, to change politics for good. MPs for the last three years have had no real electoral fear. So to quote Anne Widdicombe, our lead candidate in the South West and someone known for plain speaking, uh, Anne has said that either we leave or they leave. And that really is the message coming from this morning. We don't know when the next general election is going to be. It could happen sooner than we think. What we do know is that on June the 6th, there will be a by-election in Peterborough. Uh, we're going through a candidate selection process at the moment. We haven't yet selected. We've got some very difficult choices to make, given that nominations close at four o'clock on Thursday. We will be contesting that by-election. We will have a first-class candidate. The party is only four weeks old, so we don't exactly have much data in Peterborough to go on, but we will give it our best shot. But let me tell you what we are doing today. And as of 11 o'clock this morning, um, our website added, added a new page. So you can now go to www.thebrexitparty.org forward slash candidates. And we are, as of today, recruiting candidates to fight the next general election. We want 650 men and women. <laughs> We're looking for 650 men and women, and we want people with real world experience. People who either in civic life or business life have got some achievements under their belt. It will be a very new kind of politics. We will, over the course of the next few weeks, begin the vetting process, and it'll be rigorous. And we'll begin the interviewing process, and we'll start allocating people towards seats. We already have uh, 1,250 um, applicants who applied for the European elections um, and we will obviously be asking them to consider whether they want to go forward for this as well. I anticipate thousands of people coming forward uh, but I feel confident that if there was a general election that took place any time from September onwards we would be ready to fight it. How are we going to fund it? People keep asking me how are we going to fund it? Well as Richard has said uh, we're now up to 88,000 registered supporters so well over £2 million has come into the party online over the course of the first few weeks. Um, over 90% of our funding has come in £25 sums from members of the public, although I think that may be about to change. Uh, and I say that because there are now a few much bigger donors, traditionally donors to the Conservative Party, uh, who we are now in conversation with, uh, because they understand and realise that to fight a general election seriously, we're going to need big bucks. So with that is perhaps work in progress. No one in the country knows more than me how difficult it is under the first-past-the-post system to break the two-party stranglehold. You know, I quite well remember 2015, four million votes and not really very much in return. But I would say this that if a clean break Brexit is not delivered, then my view would be that the Brexit party in a general election would get many, many more votes than the, three, than the four million 
I managed to get as leader of UKIP all those years ago. We're getting ready. We've had enough. We will not be lied to and deceived anymore by our political class. We've got a huge number of people in this country out there who sympathise with us. They're Conservative voters, they're Labour voters. In many cases, they're people who voted in that referendum who'd never voted before in their lives. And I would just finish with this message. Don't underestimate us. We know what we're doing and we are going to change politics for good. So we can take some uh, questions. Yes, hi there. Uh, Carlos, Carlos Fresneda from the Spanish newspaper El Mundo. Uh, I would like to ask you if, uh, um, if what happened in Spain with the Popular Party will happen here with the Conservative Party. And what's your opinion of the Vox Party in Spain? I've never come across the Vox Party. I noticed they went from nowhere to getting 10% of the vote. Um, it's part of the, I suppose, populist is the word, uprising that's happening all over Europe. Uh, but it's not just happening on the nationalist right, it's happening on the left as well. After all, it was Beppe Grillo's centre-left five-star movement that actually topped the poll in the general election in Italy. And I sometimes get the feeling that those of us in this country who want to leave the European Union, who've been Eurosceptic, in my case, for decades, we're kind of painted out as being a bit odd. Maybe we are, I don't know. But, but as if the rest of Europe thinks it's wonderful, it's just you Brits living on your silly little island that feel like this. And the truth of it is, actually, the forces of opposition uh, to being governed by an unelected European Commission are growing right across Europe. And I've always felt that one of the benefits of Brexit is that it would lead the way for other countries in Europe to take our lead and that ultimately we'd finish up with a Europe of you know, independent nation states trading together, cooperating together, being friends with each other, uh, but actually having their own democratic systems of self-government. And in the end, that's where Europe will finish up. I'm absolutely certain of that. The Peterborough shortlist now is down to three, uh, and that's a decision that we've got to make, well, really, within the next 24 hours, as the, as the documentation has to be in by four o'clock on Thursday. And we've got some national figures that want to stand, but equally some very interesting local figures that want to stand. Uh, we've been busy travelling the country over the bank holiday weekend, speaking at, uh, at Brexit party rallies. Uh, we are going to turn our minds to this this evening. Coincidentally, we are in Peterborough later on today, um, as purely coincidentally, you understand, um, as part of our uh, European election tour, um, and, and we, we're, we're going to put our minds firmly to that this afternoon. Um, in terms of what I will do, well, it's quite difficult to ask everybody else to do it and not do it yourself, isn't it? Uh, and, and, be, I mean, and beyond that, no, I haven't thought specifically about where or how. Um, that doesn't really matter. What matters is that we get our organisation in place I think we surprised people in this European election when this brand new party appeared perhaps rather like a jack-in-the-box. Uh, and I think we have surprised people. You know, we are, we are well-organised, professional in what we do. Um, and we have to now do that, not just for a European election, but for a full-scale general election. We will do it, and the work starts today. Chris. Do you know, I'm actually more interested in Tory donors than Tory MPs at this present <laughs> moment in time. Uh, my, my previous experience of recruiting people into my former party, before it went rotten, um, whether they came from the Tory party or indeed from the Labour party, uh, they brought with them uh, this constant squabbling, this constant infighting, this constant backbiting. I feel that after a few years in, in, in Parliament down the road, 
that's what people become. And I, I really question, looking back on it, whether doing those things brought me any benefit or us and our cause any benefit whatsoever. So uh, actively recruiting MPs that affect to us is, is, is quite low, to be frank with you, on my list of priorities. If there are people that genuinely want to come and do this with us uh, and, 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 and are prepared to you know, put aside uh, all of that backbiting, all of that game playing, all of that student politics, and come and join a grown-up party, then we'd be very pleased to see them. But uh, I'm not sure there were that many that fit that category, really. Did you? Okay. Hi. Hi, uh, Jess Parker, BBC News. Um, you said you wanted your elected MEPs um, to play a significant role in any negotiating team. How will you make that demand? And if it were to be a, a WTO Brexit, how much negotiating would there even be? Well, it's very, very nice to see the BBC here, I must say. No, it really is. I, I've been all over the country uh, speaking at big rallies with a couple of thousand people at most of them. We haven't seen the BBC at any of them, so it's jolly nice that you've made the effort to come along here this morning. Uh, I also noticed that on no single major uh, current affairs debate or news programme, program has a single person from the Brexit party appeared. Uh, quite what that means for public service broadcasting in the future, I really don't know. But it's jolly good that you come today. Um, I think in terms of legitimacy, uh, if the Brexit party wins this election, arguing for a WTO Brexit, and we get significant support and we win, I think we will have democratic legitimacy uh, to have a say in how we proceed from here. The new date we have is the 31st of October, all right? We absolutely believe that the UK must, must, must leave on that date. And if we were part of that discussion, I think we could offer them a very sensible way forward. I think that's right. I mean, the reality is that, you know, Westminster's had its go and it's failed. And the country wants some proper, competent people to negotiate the way forward. I went to the WTO in Geneva. I met very senior people there. Uh, you know, they recommended that we move forward with uh, the European Union towards a, uh, using an Article 24 arrangement under WTO rules to come up with an interim uh, arrangement which, you know, we could take forward and then negotiate the detail thereafter. That is available. It's quite extraordinary that this government has refused to go down that route. It's utterly inexplicable. Uh, that lots of Tory MPs have actually recommended that. The government have not listened. Uh, they've just ploughed on with their current arrangement that has been rejected, as we all know, three times. How many times more must the worst deal in history be rejected before actually some people in government in number 10 listen and realise we need to go down a different path? Uh, Jonathan Nisby from Brexit Central. Nigel, you're, select, you're saying you want to select 650 candidates for the next general election, kind of starting now. Uh, does that mean, A, that you think the elect that election may come sooner than we think, and B, that you won't be giving a free pass to any MP, even if they have a pretty pure voting record on Brexit? Someone like Kate Hogan well, or Steve Baker. Jonathan, I think in terms of predicting what's going to happen, none of us have really got a clue, have we? No one knows. We're in the most, we're in the most volatile state of politics right now we've ever been. Um, and you know, the chances of this government... I mean, if Mrs May does try and push ahead with this deal, there's quite a strong chance she'll get brought down because there'd be enough on her own side. I think even an emotional confidence that might vote against her. So I don't know, but I want us to be a professional political outfit that is ready for that contest. Uh, in terms of, well, you, you can always have debates about who you don't stand against. I'm more interested in what we're going to do rather than, than, than what we're not going to do. And it's very tough to know who to trust. I mean, there are names like, I don't know, Dominic Raab, Boris Johnson. I mean, we were told they were, you know, proper Eurosceptics, you know, absolutely hold with uh, what they said during the referendum and Boris writing about vassal state and all the rest of it. And yet they both voted at third attempt for this new treaty. It's not a deal, it's a new treaty, Monsieur Barnier's treaty. So very difficult to work out in the final analysis who in that place you could really trust. Would our door be open to talk to people? Yeah, of course it would, but that's not our priority. Our priority is to get ourselves ready to fight a full national 
campaign. Um, an editor from German television. Um, we've been at one of your rallies uh, in Devon the other week, which was pretty impressive. Um, you. you just said now 90% of your donors are small donations. Um, so who is the rest of the 10% that you haven't mentioned today? And when you, will you disclose that? <laughs> it's actually marvellous, isn't it? You know, I mean, here we are. Uh, we've launched the most incredible grassroots funding operation that's probably ever been seen in British politics. And everyone's worried about what the 10% is. We have one donor who's given us a £100,000 cheque and we will report his name in line so with the law, in line with the law and every other political party. When? After the European elections? It, when, the, when, the Electoral Commission, when the Electoral Commission decides to publish it. We've already registered that with Elcom. Whenever they want to publish it, they're happy to. So after and, the elections. And I'd also be very keen to see, you know, who's funding some of the other parties. Some of those that are campaigning for change but don't really want change, whatever it may be. Um, but look, the real story here is you know, we're raising money in £25 a pop. We're raising it, I think, in quite significant numbers. Hi, Nigel. Sebastian Payne from the FT. Ask two quick questions. One, why are you not standing in the Peterborough by-election? And two, out of these bigger donors you're talking about, can you confirm that doesn't include Aaron Banks or anyone who has given to UKIP in the past? As far as Peter was concerned, well, look, uh, I think there's a possibility that we might be going to Brussels and Strasbourg with quite a large number of people. There are some sitting here in the front row. I'm not sure any of this lot have ever even visited the European Parliament, uh, let alone understand how the place works. Now, after 20 years there, I've got a reasonable half idea of how things operate. So I see it actually as my duty to take a new team of people to the European Parliament to lead them and hopefully help them find their feet. So for me, it wasn't even a, a debate about Peterborough. Um, Aaron Banks is not donating money to this party and will not be donating money to this party. Uh, and as far as any previous donors, well, we'll see. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see. What I was specifically saying this morning was that there are people who have not given money to us before, but had backed the Conservative Party, who, who are now looking at us um, and taking us very, very seriously. Because they're asking themselves a question. Even people who've been loyal donors for decades are asking themselves a question, what is the Conservative Party for? What purpose does it actually serve? And, 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 and that's a very real debate that is going on in Conservative circles. Hi, sorry, I didn't see you behind the Hi there. Uh, Rowena Mason from The Guardian. Um, Nigel, do you regret going on the InfoWars Info programme um, discussing conspiracy theories with Alex Jones? Well, uh, Rowena, I, since 2008, I've done a huge amount of global media. I've done, I mean, I've done national television in China, you know, quite regularly. I've done stuff from all over the world. As far as the InfoWars site's concerned, I've done it very infrequently. I mean, Perhaps once every couple of years, I've appeared on those programmes. Because you appear on programmes doesn't mean that you support the editorial line, necessarily, of those podcasts, broadcasts, newspapers, or whatever they may be. And I know that Jones is accused of conspiracy theory, and I think that there is, without doubt, some truth in that. Uh, I've never been a conspiracy theorist uh, at all, uh, and one or two of the... Uh, so-called allegations uh, that you published this morning are, uh, should, should we say, wide of the mark. Uh, but there are conspiracy theorists out there, uh, and indeed your newspaper has endlessly written about how I've been funded by the Russians, close to the Russians, uh, how, I mean, even a fabulous observer piece suggesting that I was running memory sticks from President Trump straight into Julian Assange. So I think when it comes to crackpot conspiracy theories, you're way, way ahead of me, Rabina. Thank you. Hi, it's the back there. Hi, uh, um, Emilio from Politics Home. Can you just tell us a bit more about what it really means for your MEPs to be part of negotiations? Does that mean you're going to be sitting in there with government ministers in the working groups? Does it mean you want some kind of representation maybe at European Council level? Uh, and secondly, could you, you said that Aaron Banks won't be putting any money in. Is there a reason why? Is that a decision on your part or on his part? What's the reason? I'll deal with that in a minute, would you? Uh, look, Aaron Banks has had a whole series 
of unfounded allegations made against him, and he's still defending some of them. The Electoral Commission side of things is finished, with the judge saying there was no dishonest intention with Leave.eu whatsoever. He still has other issues to clear up, and I'm afraid what happened in the wake of that referendum is a series of baseless allegations were made against many people involved in the Leave campaign. So that is still, there are still some bits of unfinished business there. In terms of the, uh, the negotiations, yes, absolutely, we want to be right at the heart of it because we're setting out a very clear mandate. We want a WTO Brexit and we've got the most skilled, most experienced negotiators that any political party would ever have had. So it makes complete sense. When the voters of this country, hopefully if they vote us to win this election very clearly, it makes complete sense that we have a direct elected democratic mandate to play a significant role. So yes, we should be in the room, we should be helping doing the negotiations, because that is what the democratic will of this country will be. Chris. Is the Brexit Party a high tax or low tax party? I only ask because when you start selecting candidates for a general election campaign, you've got to answer questions beyond the word Brexit. And Nigel, why do you think you've got a chance to be elected as an MP again, given your repeated failures to do so, so far? Well, I know it's very difficult when vast sums of money illegally are being spent against you, but hey, that's, that's just the way it was, which gets to the heart of something. Political reform, one of the major points about that, 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 that already unites our candidates and our supporters is we want genuine political reform in this country and of course I'm talking about some of the institutions, I'm talking about the abuses in expenditure in elections, I'm talking about the way in which postal votes are now used uh, very differently uh, to that which was intended. Uh, we do on the pledge card give you a hint um, about regional policy, you know how we see vast sums of money for example being spent on HS2 which is great for wealthy London commuters to go back and forth to the north, uh, but actually we feel that money could be better spent in the Midlands, the North, South Wales, parts of, parts of this country that really do need investment. And you see, already you can see from across the political spectrum, our candidates agreeing. I am not going to go any deeper or any further into that until after May the 23rd. And the reason I say that is we are fighting this European election on the key question of democracy. You know, are we a democratic nation? Uh, are we somebody that the rest of the world still respects? Uh, or have we become something uh, virtually unthinkable uh, for a place that boasts the mother of parliament? So we're fighting on democracy, we're fighting on trust, we're fighting on competence. You will hear a lot more about broader policy after May the 23rd. Well, why can you go Chris, I mean, frankly, that's, again, very, very low on my level of interest, all right? You don't need to be in Westminster to change public opinion in this country. There are lots of different ways of doing it. But let's be clear. You know, I do not believe we will ever get a meaningful Brexit with this current government and this current parliament and this current political class. And so unless, unless they listen to whatever we're able to do on the 23rd of May or perhaps able to do on the 6th of June in Peterborough, unless there is a fundamental shift in terms of what MPs are prepared to deliver, we are going to have to start to replace them in significant numbers. And if ever there was a time to break the first past the post system, it's now. Your last question at the back. Thank you. Uh, Lizzie Buckham from The Independent. Um, Mr Farage, do you have plans to meet Donald Trump when he is in the UK next month? Uh, well, the last time um, Donald Trump came to the United Kingdom, uh, one of the red line negotiations from our genius British government <laughs> was that he shouldn't meet me. And you would have actually thought, wouldn't you? Uh, you would have actually thought, given that there are closest military ally, our closest intelligence ally, uh, given that in terms of trade and business, they're the biggest investor in this country, we're the biggest investor in their country, and given that I do have a friendship with the US president, but perhaps as significantly, I know many of the other senior office holders in that administration, you would have actually thought that if the Prime Minister and her team were acting in the national interest, they might have wanted to use me at some point over the course of the last couple of years. But of course they don't, because they're not acting in the national interest. They care about narrow sectional party interest. And, and I see this right across 
the Conservative Party and the Labour Party, our two-party system is broken. It's not fit for purpose. They're serving nothing but themselves. And it's the Brexit Party that is going to try and break that. And that may be highly ambitious. It may be a difficult thing to do, but that is what we're going to try and do. I think the truth is, it's about the only red line that the Prime Minister's kept to. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I think, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the press conference. Thank you very much, all of you, for your interest, for attending, uh, and have a very good rest of the day. Thank you.